it memorized. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians 6.10. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You just got to take your time sometimes to just break into the presence of God. Hallelujah. What a difference praise and worship makes. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having uh, on the breastplate of righteousness, and have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there unto all per perseverance and supplications for all saints and for me that the utterance may be given unto me that i may open up my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel father god we thank you tonight i thank you for your word lord god i thank you father god that no weapon formed against us shall prosper god i thank you that whatever you have brought us to god you have guaranteed to bring us through father Lord, I thank you, Father God, that you have not allowed us to go into battle empty-handed, Lord God, or not to have our, our, our protective gear on, Father God, but everything we need to win this battle, Father God, you've already given us, Father. So, Lord, I ask you right now to give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying. Lord, let the word flow from my mouth. Let it go forth like seed and let it not return unto you void. But, God, let it accomplish that for which you have sent it. Let it save. Let it deliver. Let it heal, God. Let it bring understanding, revelation, and knowledge, Father God. Lord, help us, Father God, to understand your word, Lord God. To understand what we have been given, Father God. To be able to walk in what it is, Lord God, that you've called us to walk in. To be the people that you have called us to be. To be able to take the authority that you have given to us. To understand that authority, Lord God. And to be able to walk in it. Father God, I thank you. You, Lord I praise you when all God's people said amen and amen hallelujah thank you Jesus God is good you feel his presence here tonight hallelujah you know sometimes you just got to take your time and really worship the Lord because it's not something you don't get into the presence of God in a quick way amen it's good to bask in his presence. It's good to learn how to wait on the Lord because when we wait on the Lord, the Bible says that when we wait on the Lord, that he will renew our strength. How many of us need some strength renewed in our bodies? I know you've been going through a fight, and I know the fight's been exhausting, but that's why you need to worship. That's why you need to pr learn how to praise your way through your battle. Remember, throughout this teaching, I've been teaching you that it is not the big things in life that will take you out of position, that will take you out of a blessing. What, what will take you out of your blessing, what will take you out of position is the small things, the irritating things, and the fact that the small things, it could be little Little things, but little things one after another. Those things that we don't think are big things, the enemy uses them. He, it's, that's why he says we having done all to stand, we've got to learn how to stand. We have to learn how to recognize when the enemy is coming at us. When there is strife. When there is gossip, when there is, um, d you know, when people are not unified in the spirit, when there's, when there's little things here and there, it breaks up the unity of the spirit. When people are determined to have their own way, it breaks up. And you know what? That goes for every single person because every person in this room, every person who's listening to my voice has demanded to have their own way. Everybody gets a rebuke with that. 
That's why when you listen to the word, don't listen to the word for somebody else. Listen to the word and don't say a you, say a me. It's about me. Because the word of God is given to the Christian to be a healer, to bring correction and direction to you. The Holy Spirit is able to speak to each and every person. Nobody here is Holy Spirit Junior. That's not given your title. That's not your anointing. There is one but Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank God for this teaching because I really do believe that God is really starting to shed light because there is something happening in the spirit realm. I believe that things are about to break. I know the indication of your battle. I know you are battling things that you never thought you would ever battle. And it's not just the big things, you see. Because here's the thing. The big things don't take us out. You know, I've suffered a lot of loss in my life. Probably the biggest loss that I ever, I, I ever had to face was when I lost my dad. That was something that hit my heart, but it was something that was so much bigger than me that it was as, as hurt as I was, as much as I didn't understand why and what and how and all of that, I could put it into perspective that, you know, sometimes life just happens to us. And so I could see it was so obvious that there was an attack of the enemy trying to mess with my mind. But it wasn't until I started getting involved with church, I started getting involved with people on a day-to-day -day basis, that I realized my biggest battle were the little foxes. It was all the little nitpicking and the gossiping, making majors out of minors. And it's that kind of stuff, because I spoke about it on Sunday night. And as I've been studying about warfare, there's something called asymmetrical war. And asymmetrical war, basically, without getting into it too deep, is when there are two opposing armies, but one army is huge, and the other army is small. And the, and the smaller army attacks the bigger army. For instance, 9-11 is a perfect example of asymmetrical war. You had the Taliban, Pakistan, Iran, wh 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 whoever they were, it was a small group that attacked a bigger nation. But they didn't try to go after the whole nation. They knew where to hit. They picked one place, it was the financial hub. It was the one place that would hurt us the most. It would hurt our economy. And they knew that they were small, but if they could just hit one little target, if they could press one button, they could destroy. That's what the enemy does with us. See, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I'm in the army of God. God is for me, so who can be against me? But the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he tries to destroy whatever he can. It's why the enemy doesn't come at you sometimes. In, you know, if you were to walk into a room and you were to see a big dog who was growling and, 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 and drooling and barking at you, you would have enough common sense not to walk up to the dog and try to pet it. But if somebody had one of those little dogs, oh, let me see that, it's so cute. But that dog has got a problem. You wouldn't expect that dog to snap at you. And that's what the enemy does. See, the enemy, if you notice, he uses Christian against Christian. In the word of God, you never see demons fighting against each other. 
Because the one principle that the devil really, really understands is a house divided against itself cannot stand. So what he tries to do is he tries to distract us with little darts. And that's why God says, listen, I need you to put on the whole armor of God. We're reading and studying out of Ephesians chapter 6. But if you begin at Ephesians chapter 1, and you read all throughout the book, you will start to realize that the book of Ephesians is a book that tells the Christian how we ought to live. It tells us about unity. It tells us about how, um, you know, we're not supposed to fornicate. It tells, talks about marriage. It talks about every aspect of life. Then when Paul gets to this chapter, he says, finally, finally, my brethren. Because here it is, if we want to see success, and we want to be able to successfully put on our armor of God, we have got to be able to obey the word of God, to be able to walk in everything that he has set for us. Because the only thing that knocks us out of position of being blessed and living that abundant life is something called disobedience. Faith and obedience go hand in hand. I just want to make you aware of the stuff that the devil uses in your life to try to knock you out of position. I said it on Sunday that if the devil can't get you with discouragement and disappointment, because, you know, sometimes, boy, you hit me, I know how to fight. I am used to fighting back. In fact, I do more fighting than I do anything else. But if he can't get you through the discouragement, he will get you through success. He will take your hand, his hand off, and he'll allow you to start getting some blessings. Because the truth of the matter is, is when we hit a wall or we hit trouble, we know how to press in. But when we get some success, when, when, when we didn't have a job, we made sure that we were in church every single night praying and believe in God for a job. Believe in God for that divine connection. And we were so good at quoting the word. And all of a sudden, God says, okay, you've got that job. And now that you've got that job or you've got that little bit of success, now you're too tired to come to church. Guess what? It's spiritual warfare. God will, uh, the, the enemy will use people to annoy you in church to say, you know what? I'm not going. God can touch me home. Do you know that isolation is the devil's playground? Don't ever let somebody or something pull you away from the thing that gives you strength. If somebody's annoying you, with what they're doing in worship and with praise. Listen, I'll use myself as an example. I am always talking. I am always preaching. I'm always the one with the mic. I, I, I'm constantly doing this. So I will tell you that when I get a chance to go to church and I get a chance to just sit and relax and be blessed. And some of the churches I go and everybody wants you to slap your neighbor, touch your neighbor. Uh, people want to lay hands on you. I'm like, you know what? Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't talk to me. I don't want to hit you. I'm not selfish. I'm, I, I, I'm just in a place right now that God... I need a touch from you. I've had to tell people, listen, you go sit over there. I'm going to go sit over by yourself. Yeah, 
by myself. Are you sure you want to take that ride all by yourself? Yes, all by myself. I had a friend one time who got very, very insulted. Well, fine, you don't want to be with me? I said, I didn't say that. But there are times that I need what I need from God and I can't be worried about what you feel. Because understand, sometimes it's just not about you. That's why boundaries and borders, and I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but this is so not in my notes. But that's why borders and boundaries in our lives are so important. You don't have to agree with my border and boundary. In fact, I don't care if you don't agree with my border and boundary. But if you are my friend and you do truly love me and you truly do want the best for me, you will respect my border and boundary. So if I'm telling you that I'm in service and God is doing something in me, I don't need everybody laying hands on me because God has got his hand on me. And see, sometimes what we don't understand and we don't realize it is because we feel to do something. You've got to make sure that it's not you who feels it or that it's, that make sure that it's God who's telling you to do something because sometimes God just wants an intimate moment with his child. And it's amazing to see how people when they don't know how to confront, when they don't know how to use their voice, because understand your voice is your spiritual authority. Jesus doesn't work in secrets. The Bible says that when the demons all came, that Jesus by Calvary, he made a show of them Openly, he knew how to confront some stuff. See, God is looking for people that are no longer going to go shallow, but are going to go deeper. And if, if I need something from God, if I'm desperate enough because I am sick and tired of going through this battle, I want my finances back. I want my health back. And you know what? Sometimes people got to get involved with your problem because it's not because they have your best interest at heart, but because it makes them feel good. Oh, I guess I'm not talking to anybody here. Maybe I'm talking to everybody here. When, when, when we're in worship and we're learning how to wait and bask in the glory of God, it's not that, listen, we are supposed to lay hands on one another, we, but there is a time and there is a place that everything is done in decency and in order. And sometimes... When we're moving out of the goodness of our heart, we can end up being distractions. Because understand, when there's a leader, God is speaking through that vessel. Whoever, whoever is leading, that's the vessel that God is using. God doesn't need little helpers or little elves. And sometimes people don't understand, but you've got to learn how to use your voice to say, you know what? This is not good for me right now. God is calling people, and it's an amazing thing because Janine and I were speaking about it, and God called both of us at different times to take one day a week and begin to fast and to begin to pray. Fasting and praying means... We don't hang out that day. And if God leads us to a day 
that we're doing it the same day, we don't need to do it together. Or if we do it a different day, I don't see you. Don't be offended that I tell you stay home. Karen, I'm not going to see you today. Okay. Why? Because God is, and, and it's funny, when, when he started to speak to me and Janine about it, there were other people who said, I don't know what it is, but I just feel a call that I need to take at least one day a week and devote the whole day to God. When God starts saying the same thing to different people, and none of those people have conferred with each other, God is doing something. God is doing something. And God is calling his people, it is time to go deep and not shallow. It's why I am doing this series the way I am, to begin to break down everything. And it might seem so elementary because we've heard about the armor of God our whole lives. And it's an amazing thing, as much as seasoned as we are, I cannot believe the questions I've been getting on it. Because obviously, we haven't fully understood the impact of what the armor is. We are so afraid of the battle. We are so intimidated by what is going on because what is going on, everything is going wrong. There is a storm, there is a whirlwind, there is nothing but chaos, there is nothing but uh, depression. And, and, and it's an amazing thing that when you get so exhausted in your battle, when you were in an easier time, God started to, this is what gets me, God starts to deal with people and people start to get a breakthrough and they start to get an understanding and they start to see some truth in their life. And then all of a sudden, the enemy can hit a button and it will send the person right back to the dog's vomit. And you'll begin to make mistakes that you know you are stepping out in your emotion and in your fear. And you're about to destroy your life. That's why it's so important that we pray. What does the Bible say about praying? Praying always. Not just when something is wrong. Not just when you don't have or when you're sick, but pray when you're sick, pray when you're well, pray when you don't have money, pray when you do have money. Because things and situations never change the truth and who God is. God doesn't deserve my worship when things are going wrong. I don't worship God to get something. I don't give in the offering to get. If I obey God's command and I'm walking in love and I'm walking into obedience, yes, I have every right as a child of God to declare the covenant which he's made with me. I reserve the right by the spirit of adoption I can now call him Abba Father. I now can go boldly to the throne of God and I can ask. But if I'm not living the way God wants me to live. And listen, it's seven days a week. It's, it's 24 hours a day. It's 365 days a year. It is all the time. Not when it's convenient. People will press and they'll push for a season. But when things don't happen right away, and it seems like you're on that spiritual treadmill where you're running and you're running and you're running and you're running and you're, running and you're not going anywhere. It is frustrating 
But everybody knows if you've ever been on a treadmill, you run on it, you run on it, you don't go anywhere, but all of a sudden, one day, you discover your pants are too big. You, you get to that place. Why? Because you've done the work. If you want the word to work, you've got to learn how to work the word. And the word is not up to your discretion. Remember I told you about the belt of truth. Truth does not change. It does not change because you want to hear it or you don't want to hear it. I've heard people say, you know what? I go through the Bible and I take what I want and I make my own thing. Oh, yeah, people do it. And you know what? Everybody does it to some extent. Because it's easy to justify our sin. It's easy. I want that man. That's what I want. This is the guy. Because he's everything. And we get in the idea of I'm in love with what it looks like. I'm in love with what it could be. And we begin to talk ourselves into the fact that this has got to be God because it looks like God and it smells like God and it makes me happy. And we start off right because we start praying, God, bring the right one. God, show me. Speak to me. And yet God doesn't say anything. And when he doesn't say anything, then we feel the need to begin to start talking. And our talking goes from God, show me, to God, touch them. Make them. God, let them wear a green sweater. God, let her come to heaven. Let her say hello to me. When you know every time they see you, they say hello. <laughs> and you've started, you, but you laugh, but we've all done it. You might not have done it with a person, but you've done it with a thing. You've, you've done it with some, you've talked yourself into an Ishmael. See, the way the armor works is you've got the belt of truth. You need to surround yourself with truth. Understanding that truth sometimes is ugly. Truth sometimes hurts, but truth is necessary because God is truth. And if you're convicted by what I'm saying, you need to be encouraged to know that God loves you and he's saying, sweetheart, don't go there. Because the moment you go there and you step into the dog's vomit, you're going to be there for a much longer time. Because I'm just about to pull you out. Bobby and I sing that song, you're on the brink of a miracle. Just as you, God is about to do something, God, you're taking too long. And we step out and we throw in the towel and then we mess stuff up. I want to tell each and every one of you and hear this from my heart and I say it with all love. None of you are that smart. I'm not that smart. I can't make up what I'm going to do with my life. All I can do is pray and fast and say, God, less of me, more of you. God, mold me and take me. Let me hear. You lead me. You guide me. God, give me the strength and the grace that I need to walk through what it is that I have to walk through because I cannot avoid the process. If I avoid the process, I'm going to make a bigger mess of stuff. So I need to learn how to use my voice and say, I can't do this right now. I can't go here right now. You know what? I can't hear this mess. People want to drag you into gossip. You know what? I can't. I, that's their business. I don't want to hear it because it's the small foxes that spoil the vine. As a Christian, I've got to learn how to talk for myself. I've got to learn how to answer things 
for myself and not let somebody else's voice be my voice. Because when I allow somebody else's voice be my voice, I've lost who I am. If I've lost who I am, I don't know who I am, I have no authority. The authority that God gave in his word, he gave it to each and every one of us. It is a whosoever will gospel. So we've gone through the breast, we've gone through the belt of truth, we've gone through the breastplate of righteousness, we've talked about the shoes of peace. The next is the shield of faith. And what's interesting about the shield of faith is that in Roman times there were two kinds of shields. One was a hand-to-hand combat, and the other one was a much longer one. It almost like covered the body. And the way that it was shaped, when the Roman soldiers would get together and what they would do is they would walk in a line. And when they walked in a line and they held up their shields, it became a wall. Now, the way the enemy used to come at them was they would have these arrows. And they would take the arrows and they would wrap it up um, in cloth or something and then, and then they, they, would, they would cause it to be fire. Okay, they would set these darts on fire and the fiery darts would come at the Roman soldiers. But because they walk side by side in complete and total unity, holding up their shield, the fiery darts could not penetrate the wall. So God gives us the shield of faith. The shield of faith is not about the gift of faith. It is not about the faith that we need for the big things that we get hit with. The shield of faith, because understand, he says you put the whole armor of God on. This is not something that you put on once a year. It's not something you put on. You put it on every single day. The shield of faith is the faith that you exhibit every single day. Everybody's got faith. You have faith that when you get into the car, your car is going to take you from point A to point B, hopefully. Okay? You, you, you've got stuff that, you know, you, you put faith in, in everyday little things. Um, but here's something what faith really is. It's about trusting God in everything. If I was to take this chair... And I sit, if I sit, on, if I sit on the chair, all my weight is resting on that chair. If I see a chair that looks a little wobbly, I'm not going to sit on it. Why? Because I don't have faith that that chair is going to hold me up. So the faith that he's talking about is when I sit in a chair, I am resting all my weight on the chair. I have faith in that chair. We all execute practical faith every day. We in restaurants, we cross over bridges, we drive our cars. But faith in God is different from faith in things or people. True faith, I want you to write this down. True faith is only reliable as the person or the thing you are trusting. True faith is only as good as the thing that you are trusting. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not 
to your own, your own understanding. But acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your path. Okay, we trust in the Lord with everything that we have. God, my trust in you is not based on what I'm seeing or what I'm feeling, but I'm trusting on you. Notice that it says, lean not to your own understanding. Remember, if I take the chair and I put all my weight on the chair, I am trusting, I am putting everything that I have, I am putting weight on the chair. If I don't believe that this chair can hold me and I lean on it, guess what? It begins to slip away. It won't hold me. It's what I talk about where you've got to have, yes, we know the word. Yes, we can quote the word. But are you putting all your weight on the word? Because if you're leaning to your own understanding, you are leaning to the point, well, okay, this is logical. This makes me feel good. It means I'm not putting all my weight on God. Because God says, my ways are higher than your ways. You see, you can't benefit from the word of God if you don't trust in it. It's why count it all joy, because it is the trying and the testing of your faith that makes you strong. But God, I've been praying for a mate. God, I've been praying for a ministry. I've been praying for a job. But have you really put all your trust? Are you completely leaning on God? Faith is only good. The, tr the faith in people is only as good as if you believe it. If you put all your weight on it. You understand what I'm saying? We believe in God. We believe the word is true. Yes, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. But when I'm in the fiery furnace, do I really believe? Do I really believe? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into the fiery, they were threatened. And they, they opened up their mouths and they said, listen, we don't care. Throw us in there. But I'm not worshiping your gods. I'm not bending my knees. They weren't playing. And so what they did was, yeah, you're going to believe? Well, let me test that out. And they didn't waver. They didn't say, oh, uh, well, well, wait a minute. Well, you know, all right, God won't, won't, God won't get so mad. You know, I'll, I'll live to fight another day. Go throw us in there. And they were putting all their weight on God. They put all their trust. They were able to decree and declare something and walk it out and experience the victory of it because they put all their weight on it. Many times, and this is what the Lord has shown me, and this is why we're going through this, is that we go, yes, we will go into our prayer closet, and yes, we will quote the word, we will speak the word. But the problem is, when the word is challenged, it causes us to shift our weight. And we start to lean on people. We start to lean on things. 
And God says, not that the people are bad, but you can't trust the people. Listen, a hundred million anointed people can come up to you in your moment of despair. And they can hug and they can kiss you. But if you don't believe the word for yourself, you're not going to see the manifestation of it. It's one thing to understand that the word of God is a powerful thing. But are you really resting in the word? Because understand, when something comes, it is the enemy who is trying to trip you up. And it's why, God, I don't take anything for granted. Now, I'm not saying that you become so spiritual, so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good, that you, that you swing out of balance the other way and, you, you know, and you're... God, what do I wear? And God told me this. And God, I'm not saying that. Because people go crazy like that too. But I'm talking about knowing the word. Knowing what is God. How do I know what is God and what's not God? Because I look in his word. Because his word is truth. It's not his truth. is not about what I feel about it and makes it true. His truth is is true despite how you see it. His truth does not change. Faith and obedience go hand in hand. If I've got the shield of faith and I'm walking in faith, the reason that faith and obedience go hand in hand is because if I'm trusting in the word of God and I'm putting all my faith and all my, all my weight on the word of God, then I'm saying, God, if you said this, it's true. So if you've told me to do something and I've put all my weight and all my trust on your word, I'm going to be obedient to it. That's why the Bible talks about faith without works is dead. Now, faith without works doesn't mean because I work it and I got faith and I try to add faith to it, that it'll happen. I could, I could work myself the way I look, the way I, the way I dress, to try to get someone's attention and have faith to believe that that's going to happen. But if God's not in that, it's not going to happen. That's your flesh. And be very careful that God doesn't allow you to have what you really want. Because it will destroy you no matter how good it looks. Because the devil is a wolf in sheep's clothing. So faith and obedience, they go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. And faith must be put in the right place, and that's God. Just like your righteousness. Your righteousness is not about you. If it's about how good you are, you are self-righteous, and you are in a big, big heap of trouble. But when I know that I am the righteousness of God, because it was Christ's righteousness that was imputed to me, it was given to me that I walk in the righteousness of God. I've got that badge of honor. I have faith in that. I love these verses, 2 Samuel 22 and 31. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven, and he is a shield to all those who trust him. Psalms 119, 140. It says, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Proverbs 30, 30 uh, verse 5. The best way to block the darts of the enemy is to put the shield of faith up. 
with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, and then the shield of faith. What are the arrows that he sends at you? Puts somebody who's got what you want in front of you. Arrows of, of, of discouragement, of disappointment. So many times you've been praying for something, praying for it, and it has not happened yet. And the devil starts to make you think, it's never going to happen. Just because it's delayed, it doesn't mean that it's denied. Sometimes things are delayed because God wants to see, you know what, you, you, you still don't have all your weight on me. You, you've, you've got one, you're, like, you're kind of teeter-tottering. Yeah, you've got a lot of yourself, but God is not about a lot. God wants the whole thing. He wants the whole thing. The next we move on to the helmet of salvation. This is the fifth piece in the army. And it's an important one. The helmet of salvation, when soldiers used to put helmets on in those places, sometimes they were made of all metal. Sometimes they were made of leather. And it's obvious why is a helmet important? Because it protects the head. But the helmet of salvation. Everything that the devil tries to mess you up with always begins with a thought. It's why he starts off. Remember, it is not in co it's not coincidence how Paul puts the armor, tells you to put it on. First, you put the belt of truth. Because you've got to be able to discern the lie from the truth. Write this down. Perception Gone unchallenged is devastating. Perception gone unchallenged is devastating. What do I mean by that? Every one of your issues, every one of my issues, all began with a thought that was created from an experience. You grew up in a house. You've only seen your house. You've only seen your family. You've only seen your tradition. You only have your parents. So you created a belief system. So when you see something, you know, you don't ever really, when you, when you were growing up, especially, you know, I'm, I'm 46, so if you grew up in my generation or, or before that, you were taught not to think for yourself. You were taught to never challenge authority. See, it's not that way with kids today. Trust me, I got three of them. See, it was enough when we were coming up, mom and dad would say, because I said so. Because I said so. Okay. And you were afraid. You know what I mean? Like, they were good. They, they, they put fear in us. Sometimes I think this new generation, they could use a little bit of fear. But today... See, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful, you know, I, I, started, I started to get a little nervous with my son because my son went through a phase, boy, that he really, you know, I, I, I grew my children up on the Lord. I made sure they had the word of God. But, you know, they're in school, and especially when they get to high school, 
I, I got to tell you something. I don't remember it. I don't know if it was, maybe I was just in slower tracks, but I don't remember being taught about politics. I, I don't remember. I mean, my kids, I can sit there and have a conversation with them, and they know what's happening in the world. And they have opinions about it. Some of them are good, some of them, hold on. <laughs> you know, you do, sometimes they, they have an opinion, but they haven't had enough life experience. And they're being taught in a humanistic environment, let's say. I don't want to get myself into trouble here. And, and I raised my child with the word of God. Now, it's funny because Charlie and Kimberly both had a teacher, the same teacher. And it was about world history. And part of world history was they talk about everybody's religion. And everything that they were taught at home was challenged. It was challenged. And we think to challenge something is a bad thing. But thank God for truth, because when the word was challenged in the classroom, it made my, my, my daughter, she was just like, oh, no, 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 let me tell you. And she, and she but, but my son, it made him step back. And he started to study and see the difference. Because he grew up with a certain perception there was only one thought and one, one thing that he was taught and one thing that he knew. And all of a sudden, he was seeing another perception of something. So he started to challenge the perception. And when he started to challenge the word, he said, these people are crazy. Because <laughs> he found out there was only one way one truth, and one life. See, and this is where the church, I think, has fallen short. In some churches, because there are some churches that are wonderful in their discipleship programs. But I know when I was coming up, there was no question and answer. You sat you listened, and you were told. What happened to me, I believed everything that I was ever taught. But when I started to experience certain things in my life that appeared to go against what I believed, when, you know, death happened, when I prayed for something and it didn't happen, because nobody told me about process. my perception started to get challenged. So I started to challenge it. And because I had to get my mind right because I knew something was out of sync. You mean to tell me, Karen, you doubted that you questioned? Yeah, I did. I didn't understand how you could try to be doing everything right and it seemed like everything was going wrong. And I was so taught what to think Nobody ever told me how to think. So you have to start to challenge things. Because we've all had stuff in our life that even though good people taught us some things, there were some things that were untrue. We were given a good foundation but unfortunately, there were some cracks in the foundation. I'm not putting anybody down. But there were some thoughts and some mindsets that I got. Listen, sometimes you've been through some abuse in your life. Sometimes you've had, you know, hurt after hurt after hurt. You've had some challenges. It, all of a sudden, you know, 
That's where insecurity comes. There is a perception that you have about yourself. So when the lies come up, see, this is why God says you need to guard yourself with truth. Because when the devil tells you you're a loser, when the devil tells you you're never going to make it, God can't restore that marriage. He can't heal your body. These are all perceptions. They are all thoughts. You need the helmet of salvation to be able to challenge the perception. You've got to be able to walk in your spiritual authority and challenge the perceptions that the devil has hit you with. Well, how do I do that? Well, you need to see what you think and what you believe about a certain situation in your life. And you need to go into the word and find out if what you are believing lines up with the word of God. Because that wrong thinking that's in your head. Now, I'm not telling you to question the word of God. But I'm encouraging you to know the word of God. Because the word of God, it's what's going to change your perception. And he's telling you, you need to put the helmet of salvation on. Your word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I, I hold it. He told Joshua, you need to meditate on the word both day and night. Why? Because I need to guard myself with the truth. You need to guard yourself against people. That if you're going through a difficult situation in your life, I encourage you, get the negative people away. You don't, if you're in a difficult situation, listen, I understand some things are tough. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm like Pollyanna. Everything is going wrong, but I'm like, okay, but this happened and that happened. And, and, and thank God for that. Listen, when I was going through my mastectomy, I mean, it, it really rocked my world. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that. Everything I knew was being challenged. And every day of my life, it was a fight to stay positive. And I had every day to find something that I was grateful for. Something in my life that I could praise God for. And I had to train myself and I had to put the helmet of salvation. I had to guard my mind from all the stuff. I had my surgery November 11th. The month before that is October. That is known as Breast Care Awareness Month. Every single time I turned the channel, there was another cancer story, another. And you know what? I didn't feel inspired. It didn't help me. I was like, I, I got to get away from this thing. And I had to turn the television off. I had to be careful. I didn't open up my mouth and I didn't tell the world what I was going through. Why? Because I, even though people would have meant well, I didn't need their opinion. I didn't want people to look at me like a victim. I didn't want my head to be swayed. I had to put the helmet of salvation on and I had to guard myself and be careful who I shared with because that's how you get through things. Because the devil will always get you. He, you know, he, he's got no power over you but that which you let him have. But he tries so hard to get it here. To lie to you, to get you to believe something. And because we've been so taught not to challenge stuff that we don't challenge the perception. I love the way Anthony says it. People say, why me? 
And all he does is he changes the perception of it and he puts one word in there. Why not me? And when you say it like that, all of a sudden, you can start to see the good. But if I stay in the perception of, why me? And I don't challenge it. When I'm going through a battle, it looks like I'm losing everything and the enemy is winning. I've got to change my perception. I've got to challenge that thing and say, you know what? It looks like it, but it's not what it is. Because what I'm seeing is death, but I'm not looking for the death. I'm looking for the resurrection. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And so I guard my head. I guard my thinking. I don't allow negativity to come in. I, I, love, I love the verse. It says that, that um, you know, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Many times we're walking in the counsel of the ungodly and we don't even know it. Because it's easy to find people that will agree with your problem and less people to agree with your promise. People will come into unity about the problem, but they don't come into the unity about the promise unless they're water walkers. And we get upset when we start to go in our own way, in our own righteousness. See, this is why he says you put the whole armor on. One piece. If one piece is missing, you're out of balance and it does not work. I got to put the whole armor on. I got to know the truth. I got to walk in God's righteousness that no, none of this is in my own strength. None of this is in my own strength. God, my walk, I need my peace. I need to walk. I need trust. I put the shield of faith up. God, I'm putting all my weight on you. And God, I guard my mind. I know that I'm your child. I know that you will never leave me and that you will never forsake me. That you are with me Always, God, I don't listen to unsaved people. I don't care who they are. I don't care how much they love you. You cannot be equally yoked. Because a non-Christian is not going to see things the way the Christian does. Somebody who is not saved, not blood-bought, is going to give you logic, is going to give you practicality, and you are going to end up with an Ishmael. Let him who has an ear, let him hear that, because I could tell you, by the Spirit of the Lord, there is somebody that you're making a decision right now, and it's based on somebody that is trying so hard to help you, and they're sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. It's why you need to pray. How does the Bible say? Pray always. Pray always. God, give me confirmation. God, show me. I don't know about you. I am 46 years old. I am done making mistakes. I know time is my friend. I talk about it all the time. But Lord, let me be a little wise, please. I've made a lot of mistakes in the past. I've got a lot of regrets. God, you said my ladder was going to be greater than my past. So you know what, God? I'm going to do something I never did before. I'm just going to totally submit everything to you. Because every time I've put it in my own hands, every time I try to do it, I have messed up and I've messed up royally. And finally... The last piece of the armor is the sword of the spirit. All the armor up until this point has been defensive. Five pieces of armor are defensive. And there is only one piece that is offensive. 
Because nothing works like the word. The word does not fail. The word is a spiritual weapon. When Jesus went into the desert and he was tempted by the devil, the only weapon he had was the word. When you have the word of God, it is all you need because you have covered yourself with his truth, with his righteousness, with his peace, with salvation. And now, because I have all of that together, now I know what the word is. Now I know how to yield that sword. Why? Because I know what truth is. I know what God has said. I lean all my weight. I put all my weight, all my trust on his word. The word is powerful. The word is quick and powerful, sharper than two, than any two-edged sword, piercing evenly to the dividing asunder of a soul and the spirit and discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word cuts through everything. Why? Because the word is truth. If God says, I shall supply all your needs according to my riches and my glory, I understand that. But the Bible also says that we're supposed to take the word and we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved. Sometimes we're just too content to sit in church and have somebody just teach us. And I wait on everybody to teach me. And yes, I grow some, but I'm not growing enough if I don't have it in me. The five-fold ministry is given to the body of Christ to encourage and to equip, but nothing takes the place of that personal study of the word, of you making that appointment every single day that you know the word. Why do you believe what you believe? I don't want to hear because that's what that's the way it is or that's what Pastor Karen said. Well, that's what we grew up with. Listen, I got saved in a time where there was no discipleship, okay? You got thrown into the moving of the Holy Ghost and it was like, just flow. And it was wonderful. I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm not telling you that there wasn't a part of that that was, I mean, I, I, I've, I've had experiences with God in church when I got first saved. I mean, I'm longing for those days to come back. But I tell you what, when I was in my deepest, darkest moment, what pulled me out and what healed me was the word of God. It was the word of God. When I knew the word of God, when I knew how to trust in the word. That's why faith and obedience, they go hand in hand. The word is there. God tells us what to do. So many times people, I don't hear God. I'm not hearing God. No, you're not listening. And when you are listening, you might not like what he has to say. Because nobody wants to hear the word, wait. We hate that word. I hate that word. God knows that. But that's why he says, don't grow weary in well-doing. I know you hate it. I know you hate waiting. I know you hate doing good and never seeing return. Isn't it wonderful that we have an, a Savior who understands our grief? He understands our heart. He understands us, why, why we go through, why we think the way we do. That he, that's why he says there's no more condemnation. I get that you don't get it. I get that you don't like the plan. But listen, embrace it. Keep going. Keep being strong. Trust in me because in due season, in due season, you are going to reap the benefits of the seeds that you have sown. 
because I understand that I can't sow a seed and not reap a harvest from it when I've done everything I can to take care of that seed, to sow that seed, to pray. Listen, for those of you whose children have gone wayward, listen. The Bible says, and this is where you got to know the word. If you raise your kids in the ways of the Lord, they said he will never depart. And when they grow older, they're going to come around. I'm paraphrasing it. But the word does not say that they're not going to be challenged. The word does not say that they're not going to stray. You know, sometimes when my son would speak, I get a little scared. I get a little scared. Charlie, that's, you, you, you know that that's not what is right, right? And sometimes I couldn't argue with him. I just needed to let the boy talk. But I'll tell you, God's done such a work in him. Because you know why? He found the truth out for himself. And he's walking with the Lord now. He learned, he learned how to hear God. Better than I could hear God for his own life. He heard God pulling him towards this aviation thing. Oh my God, you're going to drive a car. Now you're going to be flying a plane in the air. Not my plan. Not what I wanted. But then God said, do you trust me? Because I got to put all my weight on God. That if God is able to take care of me, he's able to take care of my kid. Because after all, my kid isn't his stepchild. My kid isn't his grandchild. My kid is his child. His child. Charlie had to hear God's voice. And you know what? My plan, my desire doesn't matter. All I really want is for my son and my daughters, for me and my house, we serve the Lord. How God wants my children to serve the Lord, that's up to him. Because I can tell you as great as a plan as I can come up with, I have a God who's able to do exceeding and abundantly over all I could think or help or imagine. God's putting pieces together. Because God knows something about my future that I don't know. I've always loved the road. And I've always liked to fly. I wouldn't mind giving me a private, God giving me a private jet. And I wouldn't have to pay the pilot. I could say, you owe me. I'm reaping what I sowed, baby. Reaping what I sowed. Who knows how God does what he does and why he does what he does? That's why I say, you know what? Just follow the plan. Just go with the flow. He says, I work all things for good. Somebody walked out on your life, devastated you. See ya. I don't need your money. I don't need your time. I don't need your face. I don't need your voice. Get out of my face. You know what? I'm better off without you. Why is it that we want things that don't want us? Get lost. God said, I'm going to have an abundant life. Do I believe that or not? God said, my household is going to be saved. Do I believe it or not? I didn't finish completely everything I wanted to say tonight. But next week, we're going to start learning how to pray with the armor. Because I'm going to show you some secrets that I guarantee you that you've never heard before about the armor. Because the Bible says it's not that we don't pray. We don't pray the way we ought. And the armor of God shows us how to pray and pray strategically. 
I want to encourage you tonight. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every word that God has spoken over you. Every word that God has promised. You will see it come to pass. But do not run ahead of God. I don't know what it is, but I just feel in my spirit there are some people here. God wants to give you an Isaac. And you are so frustrated and disappointed and so at the end of your rope that you've given up on what it is that God's put in your heart because you're saying, I'm getting old. It's never going to happen. So now you're making your own plans. Listening to the wrong people. Somebody needs to know that the Satan comes as an angel of light. Always comes for somebody who thinks they're doing good. Wait for your Isaac. Wait for your Isaac. Ishmael's are nothing but trouble. God will speak. God will confirm. God is not the author of confusion. If you're confused, don't do anything. How does God speak? He speaks with peace. His truth might cut like a knife. His commands might be difficult, but you'll have peace going through it. A peace that surpasses all understanding. Because God is not fear. God is not sorrow and sadness. God is not abusive. There is nothing negative about God. When God comes in and is in a situation, there's light, there's life, and there's love. Amen? Amen. Father God, we just thank you tonight. Lord, I lift up every situation in this place. God, I ask you right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, whoever is making major decisions about their life, changing things and rearranging things because they've been frustrated, I come against the spirit of disappointment and discouragement. Father, right now, I ask you in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. I plead the blood of Jesus around their minds, God. Lord, that you would give them the grace to wait, the strength to hope, the strength to just hang in there some more. Help us, God, to lean not to our understanding, but to put our weight all upon you. And Father, I know, God, that as we trust in you and we leave our wills and our wants and our ways to the side, Father, that you will direct our paths, that you will make a way where there is no way, that you will make the impossible possible. And I thank you, God, that you have shielded us and protected us, God, by your word and the power of your Holy Spirit. I praise you and I thank you. And all God's people said, amen and amen. We're getting ready to take our offering tonight. Remember, as you uh, give, giving is a form of worship. Giving is a way that you show God you trust him with your sacrifice. And God says that when you give, he rebukes the devourer. That word rebuke, it means he forbids the enemy to attack your finances and your house. He forbids it. I'm excited October, Saturday, October 